evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to InfoWars Nightly News with me, your host, Paul Joseph Watson. Coming up tonight on the show, Alex Jones interviews Francis Boyle, Harvard professor, on the upcoming attack on Iran and the preparations for it. That interview's coming up later. We start with the news in our top headline tonight. Leftist media resorts to conspiracy theories to sell Syria invasion. Desperate to sell another humanitarian invasion, the leftist media in the United Kingdom has resorted to inventing conspiracy theories about events in Syria as part of a campaign to depict President Bashar Assad's government as genocidal, while completely failing to acknowledge that the country is in a state of civil war. Now, according to the attacks on Gary Franchi and others, you're a you know, mentally ill thought criminal if you even question the official 9-11 story. But on the other hand, it's perfectly acceptable to talk about false flag terror if you're blaming it on one of the US military industrial complex's main targets for invasion, which of course we know is Syria. And just as they sold the humanitarian bloodbath in Libya, in Libya with this liberal humanitarian caring veneer, um, with terrorists, of course, now ruling that country with an iron fist, Libyans tortured, put in concentration camps, the Al-Qaeda flag flying over courthouses, the liberal media again, in particular the UK Guardian and the Independent, are up to their old tricks selling this latest humanitarian war. Despite the fact that the Independent Arab League report makes it clear that Syria is in a state of civil war and the opposition rebels, which the corporate media calls activists, are carrying out rocket-propelled grenade attacks, blowing up buildings, the Guardian has basically become a 24-hour rolling, 24 rolling mouthpiece for Syrian, quote, activists with Twitter accounts blaming terrorist bombings which are killing Assad's men on Assad himself. So basically you've got the, the entire leftist corporate media, both in Britain and internationally, um, characterizing these Syrian rebels as activists when they're carrying around RPGs uh, and conducting terror attacks that are killing scores of people. Now imagine if the Occupy Wall Street movement started walking around with RPGs and bombing government buildings. Do you think that the US media would call them, quote, activists, or would they call them terrorists? But the international corporate media will not acknowledge the fact that Syria is in a state of civil war and that there's violence on both sides. And why? Well, we know because the fix is in for uh, another NATO humanitarian bloodbath. Um, the Arab League report clearly says that these opposition rebels are carrying out, quote, indiscriminate violence. And yet, the Guardian still refers to them as activists and has completely prostrated itself, as I said, with a 24-hour news scroll, um, which is the platform for these activist tweets, which could be coming from anywhere. And then on the flip side, we've got The Independent, which came out with a story claiming that um, Assad's forces are killing babies, newborn babies. And this, of course, is a throwback to the manufactured tale of Saddam Hussein uh, and the Iraqi incubator babies. You remember that one was cooked up by the um, US PR firm Hill and Knowlton. So we're see seeing a similar situation unfold. Uh, and it, in fact, turns out that um, that claim about Assad killing babies comes from uh, within the halls of the British Foreign Office itself. So just because some activist says it on Twitter and then the Independent gives it credence doesn't mean it's gospel. Uh, Henningsen, Patrick Henningsen on Infowars prove that it came directly from within the British Foreign Office. So again, the leftist media is manipulating their flock into supporting this war under the guise of humanitarianism, repeating precisely the same trick that we saw in Libya uh, just a year ago. So moving on to our next story, Chinese government demands 250 million internet users provide real identities. The communist Chinese government has demanded some 250 million users of the Twitter-style microblogging platform uh, Weibo provide their real names, addresses, and identity numbers, marking a new era of internet censorship and one that the likes of Joe Lieberman want to see enforced in the United States. And so why do they want the, the real names and addresses on this Chinese version of Twitter? 
Well, it's so people will be afraid of criticising government officials, government atrocities, and live in fear that they'll get that knock on the door. It's a chilling effect. That's why they're doing it. And don't forget, we featured the clip on many occasions. Joe Lieberman told CNN in 2010, we want that Chinese-style internet here in the United States. We want the kill switch in case of war. And yet, when you look at on what occasions China blocks and censors the internet. It has nothing to do with war. It has nothing to do with genuine security concerns. They habitually do it to silence dissent about government corruption or to shut people up about atrocities that the Communist Party has committed, like the recent murders in Tibet, for example. So this is what they want in America. This is what Lieberman has called for, and this is why we need to fight internet censorship in all its guises, uh, as happened recently with the defeat of SOPA. Three headlines now that coalesce into the same issue. LAPD pioneers high-tech crime-fighting war room, reports CBS Los Angeles. We've also got out of BBC News, spying on Europe's farms with satellites and drones. And a third headline in this series out of the Daily Mail, meet the D North Dakota family of anti-government separatists busted by cops using a Predator drone after stealing six cows. And what do all these news stories have in common? Well, governments across the West have declared war on their own people, whether that be targeting the American people as the primary focus on the war on terror, as we've documented, or in Europe, where farmers are being targeted for what they choose to do with their own land. The common theme is, of course, the use of surveillance drone technology. Once the domain of overseas occupations in hunting down insurgents, now farming families who have cows walk onto their property. They're the new insurgents in modern America. Farmers in Europe who don't abide by every dictatorial mandate of the unelected totalitarian European Union, they're also the new insurgents under this surveillance drone system. Of course, we also had the report 30,000 drones will be in American skies spying on US citizens within 10 years, according to the FAA. And what will they be used for? Well, if Homeland Security and their history of using these drones is anything to go by, they'll be used to repress the American people. Remember the story we covered at the end of last year? Homeland Security aided the Jamaican government in the massacre of scores of innocent people after a botched drug raid. It was a DHS drone that provided the surveillance for Jamaican authorities to go door to door indiscriminately killing people. And of course, now we've had the announcement that uh, DHS is planning to spend $50 million on LIDAR technology to be used in both, quote, emergency and non-emergency situations for homeland defense purposes. And uh, what is LIDAR normally used for in this context? Hunting down insurgents in Afghanistan and Iraq. American people, you are the new insurgents, according to the Department of Homeland Security. Next story, no female TSA agents means no flight for Denver woman. This is out of Fox 31 Denver. Quote, they wouldn't let me get on the plane because I'm female, winning said. And this is, of course, the lady who was prevented from taking her flight. She said she checked in and arrived at security about 35 minutes before the scheduled departure of her United flight. Quote, they asked if I was on the flight to Denver. I said yes. They said that they couldn't screen me because they've sent all the female TSA agents home, winning said. A female agent was necessary because of those new pat-downs. That's right, those new pat-downs where they go directly in the pants and touch your genitalia. That's why they needed somebody, uh, a female screener in the building, but they'd sent them all home. And so there you have it again. Another perfect reason for airports to take advantage of the recently passed provision that allows them to evict the TSA altogether and replace them with private screeners. You know, never mind Joe Lieberman and Sheila Lee Jackson whining about a new 9-11 if the TSA are evicted, uh, you know, because the, the perverted criminals who are routinely caught stealing, abusing old women and the disabled, you know, the morons who stand next to radiation firing naked body, body scanners, they're really proficient in spotting the terrorists. 
This is the agency that trains hot dog sellers at the uh, Super Bowl to hunt terrorists. I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. And yet people like Lieberman and Jackson are saying that the TSA is so professional, we can't possibly get rid of them, otherwise terrorists are going to hit us. Um, and then you get all these cases where they botch it every time. Knives, swords, loaded guns almost every day. There's a story about how the TSA mess it up. And so we've got them on the ropes again. Um, and people need to lobby their local airport because this law has now been passed. The TSA are forced to consider applications from airports um, to have the federal agency TSA screeners themselves kicked out and replaced by private security. So the TSA doesn't even have a female screener um, to get this woman through security. She misses her flight, and it's another example of the TSA's uh, inadequacy and another reason why they should be replaced. Shyness grieving soon to be classified as mental illness, reports Fox News. Millions of healthy people, including shy or defiant children, grieving relatives and people with fetishes may be wrongly labeled mentally ill by a new international diagnostic manual, specialists say. In a damning analysis of an upcoming revision of the influential Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM, Psychologists, psychiatrists and mental health experts say its new categories and tick box diagnosis systems were at best, quote, silly and at worst, worrying and dangerous. Some diagnosis for conditions like, quote, oppositional defiant disorder and apathy syndrome risk devaluing the seriousness of mental illness and medicalizing behaviors most people would consider normal or just mildly eccentric, the experts said. And... In addition to this, they're actually going to assign paedophiles and rapists with a mental disorder, which will give them the path to claim in court that, you know, their crimes are a result of their mental illness to get more lenient sentences, while simultaneously characterizing normal behaviors, oppositional defiant disorder, as mental illnesses. And this is out of the American Psychi Psychiatric Association, APA, which is called the Bible for Mental Health Medicine. So this is what all the establishment psychologists and psychiatrists go off. And this is precisely what the Soviets used to send dissidents to Siberian gulags. Oppositional defiant disorder. That equates to distrusting or rebelling against authority. So, you know, if your kid doesn't bow down to the Obama worship video being played in class has happened earlier this week in Missouri, they could be labeled mentally ill. And it's another excuse for putting millions more children on drugs like Ritalin. And as we mentioned earlier, you saw the Gary Franchi hit piece by MSNBC, you know, 9-11 truthers are crazy, they're on drugs, basically they're the new neo-Nazis, questioning the official version of 9-11 is now a thought crime, you know, it's mental illness to distrust the state and the official story that they come out with. So they're trying to officially designate non-conformity and free thinking as a mental illness. We're talking total psychological warfare against any kind of cognitive ability to think for yourself. Essentially, they're trying to turn us all into the savage from Huxley's brave new world. Fox Business News acts as Freedom Watch, reports Infowars.com. Fox Business Channel has cancelled one of the only shows on the entire Fox News network that was in any way informative or watchable. Freedom Watch with Judge Andrew Napolitano. In a press release distributed late Thursday, the channel announced that its entire primetime programming lineup had been changed with reruns of already existing programs replacing Freedom Watch. Napolitano's show had been airing for a year, in which time he had consistently covered major issues that other news programs would only gloss over if they devoted any coverage to them at all. Napolitano's coverage of the Freedom Stripping National Defense Authorization Act, for one, was second to none as far as mainstream news output was concerned. His legal and constitu constitutional expertise on such matters is also unrivaled. And of course, as you know, Judge Napolitano is a close friend of this show. Freedom Watch is hugely successful on YouTube. The clips on there receive tens of thousands of views on a regular basis. But you know, this is a similar situation to Cenk Yuga, the, the Young Turks guy who had a show on MSNBC, popular, the ratings were high. 
but his show got canned because he was directly told that people in Washington didn't like what he was doing, seeing through the left-right paradigm, talking about real issues, going after the real crooks, which is precisely what Andrew Napolitano's Freedom Watch has also tried to do. So Napolitano was one of the few mainstream hosts to actually give fair coverage to Ron Paul. He was one of the only mainstream hosts to routinely expose the crimes and misdemeanors of the Federal Reserve and the TSA. But, you know, he didn't talk about celebrity pablum like Fox and Friends or some ridiculous morning show like that. He didn't engage in phony partisan bickering. So he's off the air. And uh, Lou Rockwell, who was uh, just a guest on this show the other day, He's encouraging people to, uh, he's actually leading a campaign for people to contact Fox to get Freedom Watch back on the air. So if you go to the InfoWars article, uh, Fox Business News Access Freedom Watch, you can get the contact numbers to write Fox News and demand that they get Andrew Napolitano's highly popular Freedom Watch back on the airwaves. GOP strategist Ron Paul will be on the Republican ticket. GOP strategist Jack Berkman told Fox Business host Judge Andrew Napolitano, whose show has just been cancelled, as we just discussed, that a brokered convention will force Mitt Romney to pick Ron Paul as his VP, earning Paul a place on the Republican ticket, stating that Ron Paul could still win the Republican nomination without finishing first in any of the primary caucuses. Berkman added, quote, I'll make a bold prediction right here and right now following what we've been saying for a year. Ron Paul is going to be on the Republican ticket. Berkman said that the presence of four candidates for the whole race would ensure a brokered convention. Quote, the likely leader will be Romney, but he won't have enough delegates to win, he added, forecasting that um, Romney would pick Paul as his VP because, quote, Gingrich and Santorum have extremely high negatives. Nobody in their right mind would want them on the ticket. So we have, we've had a very much mixed reaction to that story since it went up yesterday at Infowars.com. A lot of people don't like the idea of Ron Paul being secondary to Mitt Romney. They think he won't have much influence, even as VP. Whereas on the other hand, um, people have argued that Ron Paul as vice president would represent a massive victory for the liberty movement. But still, the possibility exists that as he collects all these delegates, he could still defeat Mitt Romney. But if not, uh, this GOP strategist, who has been accurate in the past, he predicted the demise of the campaigns of both Herman Cain and Rick Perry before they happened. He predicts Ron Paul will, at a minimum, be on the ticket, which means Romney will be forced to pick him as VP. So we'll continue to watch that one very carefully. Moving on to the quote of the day here, from our good friend David Rockefeller. Quote, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. And of course, that goes right to the very heart of current situation with Iran, with, of course, the uh, potential that a crisis could be engineered, a new Gulf of Tonkin type incident to get that war going. Now, I'd encourage people here at the end of the show to sign up for PrisonPlanet.tv. Of course, this is the platform that we broadcast on. Um, a lot of this material goes on YouTube, but PrisonPlanet.tv subscribers get live access to the show as it's streamed. They get archives going back now years to 2004. They get daily archives of the Alex Jones show, both video and audio, um, speeches, special events, special interviews, just a complete library of material. And it is what funds this network. If we had no subscribers, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. And at the moment, we've got a special, which is 44.95 for a year. That's the Give the Gift of Truth special at prisonplanet.tv. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, if you want to support us in the information war, I encourage you to become a subscriber with all the great benefits it entails at prisonplanet.tv. I've been your host, Paul Joseph Watson. This is InfoWars Nightly News for Friday. We'll see, we'll see you next time. Take care. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. 
And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at Infowars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at Infowars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. Sign of these evil 1770 six flags. Doesn't get any more out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776 flags. Now that is Al Qaeda. Welcome back to this Friday edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I want to thank Paul Watson for doing the news portion of the transmission this evening. I'll also be back this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. with the syndicated radio broadcast. If you don't uh, have a local AM or FM in your area, you can simply tune into the free audio streams and video streams at InfoWars.com. Now, our guest today is Professor uh, Dr. Francis Boyle. He's had a long bio, but he's uh, represented the government of Bosnia-Herzegovina in stopping the UN from breaking up their country. He's helped write major uh, global U.S. bioweapons treaties. Uh, and, of course, uh, he also has uh, several degrees uh, from Harvard and was given the, the, the same training uh, in the same area uh, as Henry Kissinger. So he's, he's worked in close with these people. He's aware of their program, uh, and he is a, a guest that we always uh, find very informative when he comes on the radio show with us. But here he is on the nightly news. And I wanted to get him on about the NDAA, the SOPA Act, uh, the, the 30,000 drones they're funding to go in the skies, saying they're gonna watch farmers with them. I mean, it is like a bad nightmare. And, and, and he studied the path to authoritarianism. And, and so I wanna get his take historically on where he sees us going and ways to hopefully uh, reverse this. Because along with the authoritarianism, the thugs don't just wanna dominate their domestic slaves. They always look at the greener grass, they want Wars, because war is the health of the state. People shut up. They do what they're told. You can have no bid contracts, and you can be big war heroes. Uh, and so now the United States, England, Europe has just been swallowed uh, by the same type of expansionistic uh, stuff that we saw from people like Hitler. And a lot of people, you know, bring up Hitler. Oh, it's like Hitler. No, this really is like Hitler. Uh, or other expansionists, Julius Caesar. I'd say Stalin, but he mainly just killed his own people and did some expansionist stuff. Uh, but it's just incredible. So he joins us to talk about that. Then I want to get into his experience with the UN up close and personal. Because some people say the UN is going to save us, and the very same military industrial complex created it. Uh, I don't see that as the case, but we'll get Professor Boyle's take on it. Doc, it is great to have you here with us uh, tonight. So much is going on since I talked to you a month ago. Unfortunately, everything you've written in your books, warning people, uh, is coming true in spades. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me on, Alex. My best to your uh, audience. Right, it, it looks as if we've seen the uh, pattern here, as I said before, that after 9-11, uh, the uh, uh, financial elite in America has decided to go for broke. Uh, they went to uh, first uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq. Uh, Obama went after oily oil and gas in Libya. Uh, now they are going after uh, Syria. 
and uh, it looks that will be a uh, a lead up to uh, Iran, which could set off a uh, another world war. It's an extremely uh, dangerous situation right now in uh, Syria. Uh, the neoconservatives, uh, the Straussians, have always um, had their eyes on uh, uh, Syria uh, to knock it off. Uh, I served as um, legal advisor to the Syrian delegation to the Middle East peace negotiations in 1991. Now, I haven't worked for the Syrians since then, uh, but they did ask me to um, draft their opening position in the peace negotiations, which would have been a uh, full peace for uh, full withdrawal. Uh, of course, they got nowhere with the uh, Likud government under Shamir. Uh, but when uh, Rabin was elected prime minister, uh, very rapid progress was made to a comprehensive peace agreement uh, between Israel uh, and Syria along the lines of the peace agreement Israel had uh, with Egypt. So it, it was ready to go. And there were elections coming up in the spring of 1996. And Rabin concluded that he would present that peace treaty to the Israeli Knesset after the elections. Uh, the, the votes were there. Uh, but he would wait until after the elections because it was a major uh, development. There'd be a lot of debate. And he began to run, this was uh, late 1995, uh, on a peace platform. He had concluded the Declaration of Principles with the Palestinians. He had a peace agreement with Jordan. He had a peace agreement uh, in his pocket uh, with Syria. And that then would have certainly led to a peace agreement with Lebanon. So everything could have been tied up. And then, as you know, uh, he was murdered by his own um, uh, uh, religious fundamentalists and uh, right wingers over there. Uh, Netanyahu uh, was uh, elected prime minister and uh, there has been no forward progress at all uh, since that point in time, except that the neoconservatives here in the United States have always wanted to knock off the uh, uh, Syrian government uh, since then. But they're putting Islamic, jihadi, Wahhabist types in charge now in their invasion there. The same folks they used in Libya, they're now admittedly conducting massacres and torturing the French ambassador. I mean, what's the the end game after the chaos phase? I guess then route out the Al-Qaeda they put in place? I mean, this is crazy. Well, of course, we have to understand all these uh, Al-Qaeda people go back to the uh, CIA, including uh, bin Laden himself. So there have been long uh, ties with the uh, uh, CIA uh, from these people going back to uh, uh, the original uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So we use these uh, uh, fundamentalists uh, whenever we think it is useful, uh, as in uh, Libya and uh, now uh, in uh, in Syria. And yes, the the agenda is, in, in the case of Syria is simply to uh, uh, destabilize Syria and uh, perhaps crack it up into its uh, constituent units as they uh, did with uh, Afghanistan, as they've done uh, with Iraq, as they've done uh, with Libya, and just break it up into small little pieces uh, short of a nation state that really then cannot stand in the way of the uh, objectives of the United States, Britain, France, uh, Israel. And remember, uh, France was the former uh, colonial power here. It's ridiculous to think that they could care less about uh, uh, human rights in uh, Syria. And the same way with uh, Turkey. Uh, before France, Turkey was a former colonial power. Uh, so they're all, they're all working together. And they're happy to use these uh, Muslim fundamentalists. Indeed, uh, today's Financial Times has a big story about how we are now shifting all the Muslim fundamentalists in Libya that overthrew a uh, nationalist regime there under Gaddafi. Uh, we're now transferring them over to, uh, to Syria. So it, it's very clear it's the same people, uh, same agenda. And then separately saying we've got to have 30,000 drones in the skies, highway checkpoints, TSA getting in our space, groping us because Al-Qaeda is going to get us. 
and then they're using the very Al-Qaeda to commit assassinations and bombings in Iran. They just play the public like the public's totally ignorant. And I guess because the media has played along with the deception, the public is ignorant. It's just, it's, it's so absurdist that, that we're told, give our rights up, Al-Qaeda will get us. And Al-Qaeda across the board is this clandestine CIA, Mossad, MI6, secret army, same type of folks they used to overthrow Mossadegh in 53. You and I know the history, you uh, to a greater extent in many cases than I. It's just cartoonishly obvious. Now let me raise this point since you brought this up. I was rereading for whatever reason this morning because I saw it again, exactly what that editor of that big Jewish newspaper said last month uh, in, in Atlanta, where he said, you know, I've talked to Mossad people and it's being discussed killing Obama uh, if he doesn't get behind this war. And then I'm always, and I'm not a fan of Obama, obviously, but I'm seeing this pressure. There's different camps in there. Uh, I mean, this is our president regardless. And it just, and then I was watching some other news articles out of Israel with like major right wing rabbis saying, shut up, America, do what we say. Uh, you, you know, we don't care. We're going to attack. And what the editor said was great. Uh, you know, we'll do what we have to. I mean, to use the word chutzpah, there's almost like it's crazy land because they're trying to start World War III. The military industrial complex, the, the contractors want it, but the generals don't want it. Uh, and, and, and then I get emails and calls and things, and I'm pretty much neutral on Israel. I want Israel to be peaceful and happy. I'm not anti-Israel. And I get threats now. You better shut up and get behind this traitor. I mean, it's really creepy to watch because, because reading what the editor said and others, it shows a level of confidence that is 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 frightening because it is obviously insane and i, I know that's a rant it's just that uh, you can feel world war three you can see it the russians are sending in spit snatch the iranians are sending in trips nuclear weapons are getting moved around the chinese are saying brace for war even in the cold war i've studied it you lived it I, i've never seen rhetoric like this i mean it just it's just crazy uh, what's your view on that rant well, I think it is. It's extremely dangerous. As I discussed with you uh, in our last interview uh, two weekends ago, we sent uh, a U.S. aircraft carrier uh, strike force through the Straits of Hormuz and basically uh, dared the uh, Iranians to carry out their uh, threat to shut the Strait of Hormuz. Fortunately, the Iranians were sensible enough not to do it. Uh, last summer, as you know, uh, we backed up uh, South Korea shelling in North Korean territorial waters, even when the uh, North Koreans had said they would uh, retaliate. And we were fully prepared and on standby for an all Korean war. Uh, fortunately, the uh, Chinese encouraged the uh, North Koreans uh, not to retaliate. And then under Bush, as you know, uh, we encouraged Georgia uh, to attack South Ossetia knowing full well there were Russian troops there. Um, and they were killing Russian troops uh, with our arms, equipment, supplies, uh, and support. And uh, I guess they figured that uh, Russia would, would not respond, but Putin did. And uh, when Putin did respond and was about to overrun uh, Tbilisi, the United States government under Bush uh, basically cut away Saakashvili, uh, and fortunately Putin decided to stop short of uh, Tbilisi. So there we have three instances recently, uh, going back to uh, 2008, where uh, the tinder for uh, a world war uh, could have been set off. And Syria could do it too, as you know, there are uh, Russian warships right now there in the Syrian port of uh, Tartus uh, to serve as a tripwire and to uh, dissuade uh, any type of uh, NATO invasion uh, or an attack. And of course, what, what's going on now uh, in Iran, uh, there are three aircraft carrier task forces soon uh, off Iran, and we have one off of Syria. Dr. Boyle, Going back to my earlier you know, statement and question, j just specifically, 
to have a newspaper editor of a major Jewish newspaper say he's talking to Mossad and other Israelis and they're discussing killing Obama if he doesn't get behind an attack on Iran, that for me is pretty much an open threat and and you know really shows the confidence of some of the Likudniks. Um, and, and I've seen statements in the Washington Times that that they've talked to top people and that Netanyahu knows it's going to be a big war, but that he thinks that he'll come out like Churchill, that once the West is committed to this big war, uh, that he's going to be some type of hero. But as you said, other interest uh, you know, in the United States, England, and Europe, they're moving weapon systems and ships to Asia openly menacing. So it's not just Israel. It's, it's, it's the global empire, the Anglo-American establishment, whatever you want to call it, is attempting to start w wider wars. But then you ask the question, okay, if you wanted one on 888, why didn't you go ahead and give the Russians the big war if you were going to go ahead and test them? So uh, it just, it, it's, it's really frightening. Uh, do you think Obama is being blackmailed, or do you think that that may have been a threat when they said, hey, we, we can kill you if you don't do what we want? Right. I, I, whether you support Obama or not is not the issue. He is our president, and he did win a Democratic election by the American people. He's legitimately uh, in power there. And we certainly can't tolerate or support him being assassinated by anyone, uh, especially by a foreign government. And the reason this rhetoric is so dangerous is that this was exactly the same type of rhetoric we saw in Israel uh, before Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated uh, to prevent the uh, Syrian peace treaty. So, yes, this has to be taken uh, quite seriously here in the United States. And also, if you uh, follow the uh, Israeli press in, in English, which I do do, uh, it, the, the language over there is... Uh, uh, deplorable that, uh, but the same thing happened on Rabin, and that is why we have to take it very seriously. I understand the uh, Secret Service is investigating this fellow, but I, I suspect he is only the tip of the iceberg. And uh, well, yeah, this has got to be discussed on a very wide scale for him to feel confident enough to come out and say, "I'm talking to people in Mossad, and this is being discussed." I, I mean, even if they were planning something like that, why would he be shooting his mouth off? It shows just just, just a crazed uh, confidence, or was it a way to threaten Obama? It was probably both. It was an implicit threat to Obama that uh, if he stands in the way of a war against Iran, he could be assassinated, and also uh, the simply the arrogance of power that uh, Fortunately, we can rely on that, that, that some people are so arrogant uh, with power that they, uh, they tip their hand and they go, t they go too far. So wow. We have, I mean, it's, it's... Threat, we have to take this threat quite seriously because it was the same type of rhetoric that um, preceded the uh, uh, murder and assassination uh, by Rabin all over Israel. And Likud was actively participating in that rhetoric uh, and it basically inciting uh, the murder and assassination of Rabin uh, to prevent a, uh, a peace treaty with Syria and uh, any further development of a peace process. And I can assure you, uh, being at the Middle East peace negotiations, uh, uh, I advise both the Palestinians and, and the Syrians, uh, we could have had peace uh, and this whole issue wrapped up peacefully if Rabin had not been assassinated, had won that election, had concluded that peace treaty with, his, with Syria, moved on to Lebanon, and then a final agreement with the Palestinians. Uh, that could have all been done, you know, by, uh, I, I, I don't mean to, to speak quickly here, but certainly the peace treaty with uh, Syria was ready to go uh, in late 1995. What what is Likud's for people that haven't studied it like you you know a uh, uh, you know a person who's been involved in all this what does Likud really stand for I mean do they just want to keep basically a quasi military state uh, in Israel where they can get their no bid contracts and things kind of like our military industrial complex 
Well, they want the uh, whole West Bank, uh, all of Jerusalem, and the uh, Golan Heights, uh, for starters. Whether they really want to move on to Jordan from there, I can't say. As you know, the uh, sentiments in Israel uh, is like, <laughs> you know, let's let's also move on to Jordan. Uh, they Some of them do believe that uh, Jordan is uh, 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 given to them by God as well. But I think uh, Likud right now just, just wants all that territory uh, to themselves. And all the rest is simply uh, uh, rhetoric. As long as... Um, uh, Likud was in power, uh, there was never uh, any good faith uh, negotiations with anyone uh, under these uh, peace negotiations, uh, sponsored, by the way, by the United States government. Uh, it, it really took place under under Rabin and, and labor. And remember, Rabin was a general, and you know, I, I think he, I, I'm not saying he was necessarily a uh, highly principled man, but he was strategic and he, he could view it as a military situation that that peace was in uh, Israel's interest. So let, let's let cut a deal here. Uh, but but he was off. Uh, that was that. And that that is the dangers uh, with this rhetoric, these threats uh, to Obama. It happened to Rabin. Uh, it could happen to Obama. Sure. And of course, I, I deplore that. Uh, but you could imagine the uh, chaos that would be set off in this country. Uh, if, if the president were to be assassinated by anyone. Well, obviously, it's going to be a USS Liberty or Levon affair type deal. I mean, if the Mossad or somebody did kill Obama, they're going to make it look like Arabs did it or some right wing group here domestically. I mean, I don't see uh, elements in Israel killing Obama and then actually, uh, you know, actually taking the blame themselves for it. It's, uh, what's your view on that statement? Well, we do know that uh, in the first bombing of the World Trade Center, not, not the 9-11 one, uh, there was a Mossad agent running it by the name of, code name of Cindy. You can even read that in the New York Times. And she disappeared. No one knows what happened to her. So I think you're right that, that they will not do this directly. They would use uh, uh, Arabs or, or others uh, as front people and uh, and stand back, right. So, uh, I mean, Obama uh, is... A Maturian, a Maturian candidate uh, uh, type of person, they, they would get, yeah. Yes, I mean, Obama is losing value by the minute for the establishment. Uh, we know that there's all those Likudniks and ear gun people all in his office. And if I was President Obama, I mean, I would be concerned because, I mean, these folks have shown they, they, will, they will take action. They're not usually shooting their mouths off. And uh, let me tell you, I'm actually worried about Obama because that could be a false flag. I've always said killing Obama could be a false flag and it could be done by, you know, you know any of these special interest groups. Uh, I don't have an obsession, you know, with blaming Israel and perseverating all day, but you've got to point out, you've got to be honest, Israel right now is at the center of the storms that are swirling around and demanding this Iran situation. And uh, let me tell you, folks, if Obama does get killed, immediately just don't go with the official story uh, that uh, it's Arabs or whatever. Right. I, I, I think it would be a catastrophe if anything were to happen to Obama. And we would see a massive escalation of, uh, of the police state here uh, in the United States as well. So it, it's a very dangerous situation. Indeed, I, I saw on the uh, wire services this morning that uh, someone was just uh, uh, apprehended in a plot, an alleged plot to, uh, to kill Obama. Again, whatever you think of him or, or even uh, Bush Jr., um, you know, they are our presidents and, uh, you know, we cannot be conducting uh, politics here uh, by having our leaders murdered. Uh, I still personally remember the uh, you know, the tragedy after uh, uh, President Kennedy, and we really don't know who uh, was behind the uh, uh, assassination of President Kennedy and precisely why. Sure. Obviously, that's still debated. But here's an example. You're on a no-fly list uh, for suing the government and things for violating civil rights. You're harassed, and you're a you know, prestigious guy, a lot of top positions. And then meanwhile, this editor over here, he should have been immediately arrested and should have been questioned. 
not just by the Secret Service, the FBI. Okay, you wrote in a newspaper, you're meeting with the Mossad, uh, and, it's, and the murder of a U.S. president's being discussed. I was rereading that this morning. I was reading the original paper, looking at it, and I'm like, this is, this is crazy, and the guy's out walking around. You have trouble getting on an airplane for no reason. This guy can say, I'm talking to the Mossad, and they're discussing killing the president. Uh, it's, and, then, and then he's not in trouble. It's just, it's just it's, it's wild. Well, obviously, uh, people like that have a uh, very high level of uh, protection uh, in the CIA, in the FBI, in the Secret Service, uh, in the uh, Department of Justice, uh, in Department of Homeland Security. Remember, certainly under uh, Bush Jr., uh, neocons uh, were put in power in all these uh, all these agencies. So you are correct. Uh, uh, he, he has protection somewhere. Uh, to, to be able to get away with this. Yeah, because he didn't just say, option is somebody could kill Obama. He said, yeah, we're having meetings about this. And this is a, you know, don't think I'm joking, option three. This is a, uh, you know, this is a real option here. And we're looking at it. I mean, that's like, whoa, a guy saying he's representing a foreign country. And, right. you know, let's look at killing the president. And it's like, oh, well, he resigned. It's okay. Uh, two final questions and then any other key tidbits that you'd like to relay to people, uh, Dr. Boyle, we really appreciate your time and also wanted to tell folks about your books here at the end. But uh, a lot of experts, you know, as you said, all these generals are coming out, former head of the Mossad's come out, a lot of Israeli generals have said it's a catastrophe, a disaster, could start World War III. I mean, it runs from bad to worse, the whole gambit, but, but none of it's good. It just goes from disaster to Armageddon literal Armageddon, all of this going on, and uh, it, it's just still moving forward. The troops are massing. The case is being sold just like 2002, 2003 in the, in the, in the March lead up. It's all here, but from your perspective, why is an attack on Iran so disastrous, and why do you think the power structure would be leaning towards doing it? Well, of course, we also have to understand that the uh, American power elite very well might be considering just sacrificing Israel uh, and, and its people uh, to let Israel uh, start the attack on Iran, uh, using Israel as their attack dog, which Israel always has been, and then uh, suffer the consequences from the Iranian retaliation, and then uh, we get in there and take out what's left. So it could be, you know, broader than than. Uh, you know, the, the notion that Israel runs the United States, I don't find uh, very credible. They they do pretty much what we tell them to do. Not all the time, not everywhere. Uh, but we're the ones really behind the show here. And it could be that we are setting them up to, to be sacrificed, to take out Iran, and then we will pick up the pieces, which is all that oil and gas uh, in Iran, and complete control and domination of the entire Persian Gulf and Central Asia as well. And this is exactly what uh, Brzezinski recommended in his book, The Grand Chessboard. If you read his Grand Chessboard, it's all in there. Uh, so that pretty much is the strategy. It has little to do with Democrats versus Republicans. That's Tweedledum versus Tweedledee. Uh, this is the power elite that runs this country, as I said, after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, they are going for broke to control and dominate the world. And they're going to grab all the oil and gas they can, everywhere they can, and uh, literally um, uh, break up any states that stand in their way or that have created them uh, problems for them before. Indeed, Wolfowitz, the neocon, uh, had me at the, well, actually was at the University of Chicago uh, when I was there, uh, said this after 9-11. Uh, publicly, he said, uh, we are going to start to break up states. And the first state they broke up was Afghanistan, then Iraq, now Libya, looks like Syria, and then Iran. But Wesley Clark said that, too. He, he's talked about he was in the meeting, and they said, yeah, we're going after these eight countries. And, and, so, and I think that that's what the... Uh, the Pentagon, uh, apparently, Wesley Clark was at the Pentagon, and that's what they told him. And when Wolfowitz said, we are going to be breaking up states, uh, he was deputy uh, to Rumsfeld. He was the number two guy in the Pentagon.
So that simply confirms what I'm saying. Yes, that's the agenda here. And what is what is going on, all these states have control of oil and gas and transportation modes uh, for oil and gas. And well, regretfully, most of them are, uh, are Muslim. So for that reason, uh, here in the United States, we use Muslims as uh, scapegoats and boogeymen, uh, which is also what we've seen after 9-11. Uh, 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 kind of like what the Nazis did to the Jews. Everyone needs a scapegoat. We have our scapegoat. It's the Muslims here in America, uh, you know, like commies under the bed when I was growing up. And they're uh, the Muslims over there. Uh, well, I totally agree with you because, I mean, I mean, all this stuff, you know, in academic papers is it, it, really public. There's kind of the mainstream news that we're all fed, and then there's the establishment communicating with itself. And I mean, I knew this a year ago because of family in the military, but the U.S. is planning the attack. They plan to let Israel start it, take the attack, be the victim. Netanyahu's even bragged in the Washington Times that then he thinks the Israelis will rally around him, even if they don't like him because they're under attack, uh, even though they start it. Uh, he'll say he has to. And then the big one that you mentioned, they're going to then use it as a domestic crackdown. And I believe... Iran will attack Israel through proxies. That's a no-brainer. But I believe the establishment, and I see them gearing up, is going to stage attacks in Europe, the U.S., and England and use it to crack down on civil liberties and further expand it. You see them lining up for it. I mean, they are gearing up every agency of government for war with the people. It is, it is disgusting. Vice President Cheney already publicly stated that they were going to blame the next uh, major terrorist attack uh, here in the United States on Iran, no matter who was responsible. So you're certainly correct. Uh, there will probably be some type of false flag attack. Uh, blame it on Iran. Uh, use it as uh, justification for war against Iran. Of course, uh, Congress will salute and ship out. Uh, we very well might get a formal declaration of war, which we do not have now. Uh, but if there is a formal declaration of war by Congress, you might as well kiss the Constitution goodbye. There's an entire title of the United States Code that automatically gets uh, activated and uh, makes the uh, president of the United States of America a constitutional dictator, uh, just like uh, FDR was during World War II. We have not been in that uh, situation yet, although we do know after 9-11, Bush did ask Congress to give him a formal declaration of war, and they refused to do so. Uh, they gave him a limited authorization to use military force. But he showed them with the anthrax attack. He showed them with the anthrax attack a month later. That's correct. The, he, he, um, they also had the, uh, the USA Patriot Act, which is the uh, blueprint for the U.S. police state. That was being held up uh, in Congress. Uh, by Senators Leahy and Daschle, and all of a sudden they got hit with super weapons grade anthrax coming from uh, illegal U.S. Uh, military stockpiles. And media sources also got hit to make it clear to the media uh, that they better not be going after this story. So the media have all, already always uh, go along with the uh, cover up on the uh, on the anthrax. Yes. Yeah, look, Dan Rather got some. It was all their enemies. The guys that took photos of Bush's daughters drunk here in Austin, they got hit. <laughs> right. It, it was clearly an attempt to uh, terrorize and intimidate the uh, media. Not that they needed uh, all that much intimidation to begin with, since they uh, very rarely uh, report report the truth. Is there any way to defeat this premeditated constellation of evil? I guess the general public has to stop being naive and realize that we have no future if we don't stand up against this. But I'm afraid, Dr. Boyle, it's going to go the way of Germany. People are going to have to have see the empire, launch World War III, invade all these countries, and then either this empire of evil will succeed or it's going to implode, and then we're going to get invaded by the Chinese. I mean, I, I, and people say, oh, that'll never happen. Well, I mean, if World War III gets started and there's nuclear war, I mean, my God, they, I can just feel the gates of hell opening up in front of us. Well, I'm afraid you're right. You know, if you read Huntington's uh, Clash of Civilization, 
Uh, Huntington was ahead of me at Harvard. I went through the same program that, that produced that monster. And it does appear that the State Department has, the U.S. government has been following uh, the blueprint set forth by Huntington in that article, later followed by a book. First take out the uh, Arab and Muslim world and then move on to China. And at the end of uh, Huntington's book, it concludes with, with uh, a nuclear war between the United States and China. And that gets into the uh, deployment of uh, all these uh, ABM systems uh, in Europe and uh, around China, in Japan, Korea, uh, whatever. To uh, if, if we strike first, these ABM systems are uh, designed to pick up whatever might be left that the Russians and the Chinese send back at us. And again, the Chinese president comes out and says, prepare for war with the U.S. I mean, our government is not moving all the nukes over there to play I mean, it's insane. It, it, it is shocking to know America has been captured by evil and that we now, Dr. Boyle, are living, we are living in an aggressive, crazy empire that's got super weapons. I, I, I don't know, I, I mean, thank God the military has been blowing the whistle about the fake Iranian ambassador stuff and all the rest of it, and hopefully cooler heads will prevail I mean, I've never been for a military coup because those are so dangerous because you can get something just as bad. And I'm not endorsing that now. But I mean, you know, is there an Operation Valkyrie out there to stop this? Well, you can't because it's not just a president. It's not Adolf Hitler. It's a whole crew of crooks in every position. How do you stop a cult of criminals that are power mad? Well, I think you're right that we we. The military, the, there are sensible people in there, uh, unlike these neocons, who are, are completely irrational, uh, and, and they understand the consequences of what's happening. And we have to have more people, for example, like uh, Admiral Fallon, uh, who was head of U.S. Central Command, and just publicly stated an attack on Iran was not going to happen on his watch. Uh, the military uh, are... You know, they take an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States of America, and they have an obligation under the Uniform Code of Military Justice to refuse to carry out illegal and unconstitutional orders. And I think, uh, obviously, you can't really expect, you know, people at the bottom of the pyramid there, but uh, I would hope that, you know, people near the top of the military uh, just start making it clear they are not going to carry out these orders uh, because they believe they're either illegal, unconstitutional, or fatally dangerous. That is one hope we have. Meanwhile, we, we citizens simply have to get uh, organized. Uh, we still have our First Amendment rights. Uh, we need uh, 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 protests, demonstrations, civil resistance, uh, organization uh, in these elections. Whatever can be done to head off this uh, catastrophe, we're you know we are not the Weimar Republic. We're far from it, but it's clear uh, we're moving in that direction. And I, I don't know how much time we have. I I agree with you on that. Well, and the system knows once they've got a big war going, they can move us way past the Weimar Republic quickly. Right. What once they get a formal declaration of war, we've all had it. It'll be just like uh, what happened to Japanese Americans in World War II the Korematsu case, and the Korematsu case is still good law. It's never been overturned by the United States Supreme Court. And indeed, uh, officials of the uh, Bush Jr. administration publicly stated that Korematsu is still good law. And we know that FEMA has the uh, internment camps uh, ready to go. So all they need is, is a declaration, of, a formal declaration of war, and that'll be it. Yeah, I saw a former CIA director on TV once say, just round up all Muslims, put them in camps in America. And that was a couple of years after 9-11. Well, and that was the plan uh, that Attorney General Ed Meese had. Uh, they had a plan at the Department of Justice to, to do that. And uh, they were uh, setting up uh, camps to do that. I didn't go see the camps myself, but I do know people I work with who went out and saw these camps uh, in the... Uh, uh, late 1980s, and, and they are there. I, I believe they've now been uh, taken over by uh, 
by FEMA. No, they have so been. Yeah, that's that's Rex eighty Rex eighty four. Now, now in closing, as you've already given us thirty five minutes, Doctor Boyle, we really appreciate the time. I want to talk about some of your latest uh, uh, books and things uh, that are available, and tell folks the titles of those. Very, very scholarly, but also riveting reading because it is uh, su such veritas. Specifically, an example of what one guy can do, though, you did represent a, a, a major block of the Balkans and was able to stop the UN in the West from breaking up Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, you know, causing a new giant civil war and ethnic cleansing. That's on the record. And, and, and so it's an insight into what one guy can do standing up and being moral, but it's also an example of uh, you know, the type of behavior we see from the UN and others. So briefly, tell folks that story and then tell us about, of all the books you've written, what you think the most important reading is. Well, for our current uh, situation here in America, I've written two books that I think uh, could, could get people oriented, and that would be uh, Tackling America's Toughest Questions, Clarity Press, and then the uh, second, Protesting Power, war, resistance, and law. Uh, how to uh, use uh, law and the Constitution uh, to oppose uh, further warfare uh, here by the United States government and, and a police state. So if you're, I've written 15 books, but I think those would be the two uh, most relevant to our current plight. And indeed, that's why I, I wrote those two books, to, to try to provide uh, some light uh, and, and a direction out of, of where we are now. Yes, as for uh, uh, Bosnia, uh, sure, the United Nations and the European Union uh, were going to uh, carve them up into three little pieces, uh, 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 rob them of the United Nations uh, membership, um, uh, destroy them as a state, and subject 1.5 million to 2 million more Bosnians uh, to ethnic cleansing. We already had 2 million Bosnians subjected to ethnic cleansing. And behind these plans uh, were, of course, the uh, Clinton administration, uh, Mrs. Clinton, now the uh, Secretary of State, many people working uh, for Obama uh, today, uh, and Mrs. Clinton used to work for uh, President Bill Clinton, and the British and, and the French. Uh, they were the, uh, and, and the Russians uh, as well. Uh, but they were fully prepared to simply destroy this state and wipe out all of its people. And the uh, UN bureaucracy, all their lawyers, uh, went along with it. And, uh, it, it. and so I could just say from my personal experience, uh, I was uh, Bosnia's ambassador uh, to the world court. Uh, I stopped this. Uh, from happening. Uh, but the UN bureaucracy, uh, bureaucrats, these people are completely rotten, corrupt, despicable, uh, unprincipled, and fortunately mediocre. All their lawyers, politicians, diplomats uh, are pretty mediocre people. But you certainly can't trust them. And number two, however, I, I think we have to understand, you know, I, I know there's uh, uh, people who in good faith believe the UN is going to take us over, or UN helicopters. The UN does what we tell them to do. Uh, you know, if Mrs. Clinton calls up uh, Ban Ki Moon, he hops to it and says, "Jump!" He says, "How high?" And the same way uh, with his predecessor, we got these people the jobs. So they use uh, the UN as a cutout for uh, what their uh, agenda is, as they did on Libya as they just uh, tried to do on uh, Syria, as they've tried to do uh, on Iran. Sure, I mean, they, the, the imperial forces need this quasi-democratic thing that the Security Council really dictates. And, and of course, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the military industrial complex created it in 45 with all these promises at Presidio, based there in San Francisco. And, and I'm not saying the UN is gonna take America over. It's that these imperial globalist corporate fascist forces that created it are trying to transfer powers into it because it's their puppet uh, to then come in, like take here at the local level and, and jack up taxes, you know, to basically give it to, you know, corporate entities like GE. And then yes, then the UN takes the blame. Uh, but you're right, it's a total, a total cutout. It's a cutout. And, and you know, they're not, 
they're not going to give up power themselves. That they'll, but they use the UN uh, as a cut up. So uh, I don't think you know we we. I mean, there are proxies, there are stooges, there are agents, and we have to look at them that way. The whole bureaucracy there at the UN, they simply can't no. be trusted. But the real decisions get made in uh, Washington, London, Paris, Brussels for the UN. Yeah. In closing, if you notice, the generals, the colonels I talked to, the CIA people that were actually in combat in Vietnam, people that live in the real world, they're all against these wars, the drones, the police state, the NDAA. And a lot of these people, like you were saying, aren't completely moral or perfect or even good guys. They live in the real world. And so the entire military is against all these wars and where we're going. Kind of like the German military didn't want to go into Russia. Not that they were even good. It's just that they were living in the real world. Hitler wasn't. He hadn't actually been at a command level. He'd been low level in the trenches. But at least he was military to a certain extent. Now we have all these academics and people who understand statecraft, deception, manipulation, but they still don't understand the real nuts and bolts. And so you have the bureaucratic elite and the corporate owners who are becoming more and more detached from reality and who make 40 to 1 bets like Corzine, trying to command a military and a huge system through their arrogance to launch something. And I know they're watching these shows, at least their minions are. They need to understand there's a reason the military's against this here and in Israel. There's a reason the British military's against it, because they're living in the real world. And it is so creepy. I mean, you know, hundreds of years ago, the problem was the generals wanted wars because they'd be superstars and the politicians had to hold them back. Now it's the other way around. The politicians are so crazy, they want to launch wars that are so huge and so dangerous, even the generals don't want a part of it. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I think that, you know, the military uh, is used uh, by these elites uh, if you read uh, Kissinger, he had nothing but contempt for them, for, for the generals and the rest of them. He couldn't care less. And I think that's true uh, for the elites, Mrs. Clinton, all the rest of them. You know, their children, their husbands, uh, they don't serve in the military. So as far as they see it, they're just sort of a, a mercenary uh, throwaway uh, class uh, to be used as uh, they see fit. Yeah, Kissinger called them dumb animals. That's correct. And that, you know, I went through the same program at Harvard that produced Kissinger, Brzezinski, uh, uh, Huntington, Schelling, all the rest of them. That's their attitude towards the military. Uh, they're supposed to do what they're told to do. And I think, uh, you know, at least the military understands the consequences of these decisions. Again, we had a very courageous guy like Admiral Fallon say there would be no war uh, against Iran on his watch. Well, Mullen went over to Israel and in a public speech said, you guys stage the USS Liberty. Don't do that again. This was an incredible shot against the bow. That means the Pentagon has intel that the Likudniks are looking to stage something. Uh, that's true. The uh, I, for a period of time, uh, was counsel to the uh, Liberty uh, survivors. Uh, my, my dad was a, a Marine who invaded Saipan, Tini, and Okinawa. Uh, in World War II, the Marines are part of the Navy. And it's very clear uh, Israel attacked the uh, uh, Libya, or, sorry, the Liberty uh, as part of a flat, false flag attack. They were going to sink it and kill everyone and blame it on the Egyptians to, uh, or, the, or the Syrians, the Arabs, uh, to get us uh, directly involved in that war. And fortunately, because of the great courage and heroism, uh, of the men of the Liberty, who, by the way, had no weapons, uh, but they, they kept that ship uh, uh, afloat and uh, uh, survived and, and were able to tell the story. And yet, despite that, uh, the uh, 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 Israel and the neocons have so much power in Congress uh, and the courts that no matter what we've tried to do to get justice for them, We've been completely shut down now uh, since 1967. Now, I, I want to make it clear, I no longer represent them. Uh, they, have, they have another lawyer. He's giving it a try. Uh, but it doesn't look too good. I mean, we're, we're talking 1967 here. Uh, this is uh, uh, over 45 years uh, uh, later. Uh, many of these men are dying off. And I guess the theory is they'll all die off and the, and the matter will disappear. But it was clearly a false flag attack. And President Johnson 
uh, and uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Robert McNamara, when planes were mobilized on the Sixth Fleet to go rescue um, the uh, Liberty from the Israeli attack, McNamara uh, called them all back. And uh, in my opinion, having studied this matter and researched the uh, statutes, clearly uh, McNamara should have been prosecuted for treason uh, as defined by the United States Constitution. We, you know, people use the word treason all the time. Uh, it, it, it's incorrect. Uh, there's a formal technical uh, legal word uh, 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 definition of treason set forth in the Constitution and in a United States statute. I researched this for the Liberty Vets. Clearly, McNamara, who I take it was already acting pursuant to orders from President Johnson, committed treason uh, against the uh, United States of America and the Liberty Vets. And here we are 45 years later, and uh, they, they have no justice, uh, no recognition. And it shows you the power of the uh, Israel lobby here uh, in the United States, in Congress, in the news media, uh, to still uh, cover this up. Well, you're a constitutional lawyer, but this is in closing. I mean, for me, I've, I've read the statutes on treason. It's when you aid a foreign military power against your own forces or you try for a foreign power to overthrow your government. I mean, treason is opening the gate to let the enemy in. The ship's under attack. They're begging for help for hours. The jets are taken off. And, that, and I've, talked to the, I've talked to the generals and the admirals. In fact, a lot of them have died since I had them on. Uh, who were there and were on the radio phone and said, I want to talk to the president. And uh, even the, well, I'm going from everybody, but yeah, the president even came on the line and said, yes, we're not going to have an incident, recall those planes. And, and, and it's just amazing to see that definition. Uh, I mean, I'm correct in a layman's uh, uh, definition of treason, correct? I think the Liberty, having researched it a while ago, my conclusion and the advice I gave them when I was serving as counsel to them was that McNamara definitely had committed treason as defined by the United States Constitution. And there is a statutory definition of uh, treason further specifying it. Yes. Wow. All right. Well, Professor Boyle, that was a, a great 50-minute interview. I, really, I meant to do 15 minutes, but it's, it's always riveting talking to you. God bless you. And I hope we turn this around so we don't end up being political prisoners. I think if they start trying to round folks up, though, down the road, even in a war, uh, I don't think everybody's going to line up and do what they're told. It's, it's just quite a mess we're headed into. I'm afraid it is, and all we can do is uh, keep uh, struggling. And those two books I mentioned uh, will try to give your uh, listeners some information and background and uh, materials that, that they can use to formulate their own opinion and their own conscience uh, as to what they should do now, right? Because we're, we're facing uh, a World War III and uh, a military police state right in the face here. And remember, um, there's an election in uh, 2012. Uh, we could have another uh, October surprise. Uh, if, if it looks like Obama's losing, uh, maybe the only way he could win would be to uh, launched an attack uh, on on Iran or Syria. Who well, knows? a year ago, the neocons were in the papers saying, get behind an Iran attack and we'll leave you alone, we'll support you. I mean, it's just, it's all an open conspiracy against liberty. And for good old boys out there, they're like, oh, I'm behind killing the Iranians at a tribal level. They need to understand the globalists don't care about the Iranians or us either. They're t they're, they're, when freedom goes, we're all going to get hammered by this. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Boyle. All right. Thanks a lot, Alex. Have a well, good week. Thank you. Yeah, have a great, uh, great weekend. Wow, that was an amazing interview. Great job to the uh, crew. And uh, I will, Lord willing, see you back this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. with the radio show. And back Monday, of course, with InfoWars Nightly News. And uh, that is it for myself and the crew. Great job, folks. And great job to all the subscribers out there. If you're watching elsewhere on the web and want to support us and see it when it first airs and all the archives and nine years of material, prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com. We've got a 15-day free trial running right there.